but it'll give you a solenoid code. And then what I ended up finding was, yeah, it was one of the actuators on the freaking wheel that's giving you a solenoid code. But I thought it was the solenoid because there's no ground going to it. But this is the beauty thing is, you know what? I that one video saved that customer a module. and gentlemen and welcome back to another exciting thought-provoking episode of the jaded mechanic podcast my name is jeff and i'd like to thank you for joining me on this journey of reflection and insight into the toils and triumphs of a career in automotive repair after more than 20 years of skin knuckles and tool debt i want to share my perspectives and hear other people's thoughts about our industry so pour yourself a strong coffee or grab a cold canadian beer and get ready for some great conversation speaking with it's it's well go ahead <laughs> so yeah uh, mark elliott also known as uh, toba tech on tiktok and a little bit on facebook i do have an instagram account don't really use it though and uh yeah <laughs> I, don't, I don't see you much on facebook i i saw you first on on um on tiktok and then of course you know the canadians are kind of outnumbered on there right so i mean it was yeah any, yeah, no, it was honestly by even chance that I even ended up on TikTok or even doing automotive content at all. Yeah, I never, I never wanted to do it. Honestly, like I, uh, I started on YouTube with my outdoor content, mm -hmm. and I really grinded that for a year. You know, I this is what I want to do. I'm like, you know what? Maybe it'll, it'll get me out of the shop one day, and I can just make money going hunting and fishing and doing all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was such a grind for and sometimes you get 30 views and i put you know spend the whole weekend filming something spend 12 hours editing it for 30 views it yep. was you know and uh no the whole tiktok thing just kind of fell on my lap it was just like i just saw it's actually auto tech, tech mike i started seeing his videos and i'm like you know what i could probably do this you know so i started doing some quick little videos in the shop and i'm like you know i'll just start uploading them on tiktok and it just started taking off i was like wow so, you know my first few even my first few videos got a couple thousand views and i was like this is awesome <laughs> it just got me all like passionate about making content so who, who do you think is more hated on tiktok mechanics or people that are like hunters hunters and you know outdoor people <sighs> you know what tiktok just hates hunters like yeah. you know because i do have an outdoor uh, channel on TikTok as well. I got my Prairie Mountain Man stuff there. I haven't done anything with that in the last few months. I honestly, once I got the third kid, it's you know I just decided where I want to put all my energy and TikTok and Toba Tech was what was giving me the best bang for my buck. I would say, but yeah, any of my hunting stuff, Kai Bosch. I got so many <laughs> uh, community violations. Like you can't show anything or talk anything hunting wise. You can kill a fish. You can show all the dead fish you want, but as soon as it's a different kind of animal, <laughs> it, makes yeah. no sense to me. it makes zero sense to me. But I, yeah. you know, I'm I'm new to the TikTok thing, so it's like I've been on Facebook forever, and yeah. a lot of people find Facebook to be very. Uh, when I when I came to TikTok, I found a lot of people. It was one or the other. They they either really like Facebook, and they didn't really care for TikTok, or they really uh -huh. like TikTok, and they've got some negative connotations or experience about. Facebook. So, I mean, for me, I built my brand. I say my brand. I built my following <laughs> on Facebook. And you kind of saw what happened this week with the whole, you know, yeah. conversation you started, right? Has been oh, very. Yeah. And, um, but I've been doing that for years. So, when, when that kind of, when I, when I meet new people through other social media platforms and they're not familiar with me, I don't always, I sometimes rub people the wrong way because it's just, it's about delivery, right? Like, and I'm oh, not. Sure. I'm just, I'm blunt and I'm straightforward yeah. and it, it rubs a lot of people the wrong, wrong way. And I, I, it's never my intention to alienate or offend or seem judgmental. It's just very much like an open-ended observation about something. And then I'm going to leave it to Lee, like, okay, you respond. Right. Yeah. And some don't engage in the conversation. They immediately get their back up. And what I've always found with you is you and a lot of the other people in the mechanics of TikTok group. They don't, they're, they're not shying away from the conversations, right? And yeah. that's, that's why I'm there. I'm there not just to push the podcast, but I'm there to get more people that aren't maybe as familiar with what we've been doing on Facebook to still mm -hmm. be engaged in the conversation, right? So 
let's say you've got a new boss. You're at OK Tire in. Can I say you're in Manitoba? Like, are yeah. you? Yeah, I'm in, in right in Winnipeg. Right in Winnipeg. Hey, yeah. Never, never been to Winnipeg or Manitoba. I've never. You're not, miss, you're not missing it much. Oh. Although you know what, I have to say the fishing out here is pretty fantastic. Whatever yeah. species you want to go after, it's here, and we have like the trophy cat fishing destination in like I think all of North America. Pretty like, sick. You go down to the Red River and like you can sit there and catch thirty pound catfish like till your arms are about to fall off your, <laughs> your body. How's the, how's the large about bass fishing? Bass fishing though, in no the largies. There's a couple places that might have largies. There's some smallmouth, but that's more like by the Ontario border. Uh, but there are a lot of the smallmouth. At least the nice thing is it's a lot of smaller lakes. You know, you can get into these like these back backwoods lakes and stuff, and get the whole lake to yourself, which is kind of what I'm after. So, how long have you been doing this, Mark? The not just the the TikTok thing, but how long have you been in the industry? So I uh, started like right in high school. So uh, what kind of happened was it was grade 11 and we had a presentation in our, in our high school that basically the St. Boniface Art and Tech Center, you can go there for half the semester if you want to pick a trade, right? You can do carpentry, hairstylist, uh, automotive. So I'm, I'm thinking here in grade 11, I'm like, hey, I get six months away from my high school or whatever it was, five months. I'm like, hells yes, sign me up. And I remember walking into <laughs> to that first, cause I didn't know anything about cars. I always had like a knack of taking stuff apart and trying to figure stuff out, but cars was never on my radar, right? So I walk in and everybody's standing around. I think it was the one teacher's uh, old AMX uh, Javelin. Oh, very cool. And they're all like, oh yeah, this is a big old 340. Check out the carburetor. I'm like, I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> And that whole, like, six months there, I didn't really take it seriously. For me, it was just like, all right, I just don't want to be at high school, right? And then I didn't go back in grade 12 for the second semester because it was the last semester of high school, and I just wanted to be at school with my friends type thing. So when it came to time to figure out what the hell I'm going to do with my life, I went to colleges, I went to universities just to do their, you know, their, just to see what it's all about. And there was nothing that really attracted me. I was like, you know what, that all, that... That automotive course was kind of, kind of neat, right? But I didn't take it seriously. So I decided the year right after high school, I'm going to go back. I'm going to retake the six months I took and take it seriously, right? Let's see where this takes me. And so I was there for a year. So then I started in the trade, I'd say, it was about 2003, 2004. And uh, my first uh, employment was actually a Midas. So I got a job placement at a Midas and uh, I was at Midas the whole time I was basically in Winnipeg before I moved out to BC. And uh, there was a time when I did quit because I'm like, I, you know, it was funny for my first, I'd say nine, nine years of my career, I've always tried to like find something other than being a mechanic. Right. I was like, you know, but I could never, there was nothing that attracted me. Like something, there was something that attracted me to this industry. And I said, so at Midas, I left to go be an aircraft. The course was like an aircraft mechanical engineering, which I thought was more like working on planes. But then when I found out, it was more so like working on an assembly line, building parts for planes. I was like, this is not, not for me. And at that time, I worked for six, uh, six months, I think, at Canadian Tire, which was a horrible experience. Can I ask you, after nine years, why did you still feel like it wasn't a permanent thing for you? Was it the way... The, the way the industry worked, I'd say like in a store or was it you weren't being stimulated like mentally? I, th or? I think the pay had a lot to do with it, right? It was the pay and it was, I was being stimulated, but the problem was, so when I basically like, I didn't, I haven't worked in a lot of different shops, right? I basically worked with Midas. I worked at a few different shops with Midas. I worked at King Tire for six months. Then when I moved out to British Columbia, I, w I was with Midas for six months because I got transferred out there. And it was a horrible shop. The people there were horrible. Everything about that experience was horrible. So the next job I had was at a budget break and muffler, which is another big franchise out there. And I stayed there for 11 years. So I was with that company for 11 years. I learned a lot about the business end, but it was a family owned operation and it was a really hard family to work for. Yeah. Right. And, but I, you know what? It's funny. I didn't realize until I left there how much it made me who I am 
as a mechanic, right? And the business end of it, especially, right? Art, Art really knew how to run that the business properly and take care of the customers properly and stuff. It was just the whole dynamic of the sons and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So Midas, was that incentivized pay? So at the time, yes, they had a guarantee. Basically, you were guaranteed 30 hours and then there was like a bonus. And at the time when I was in Winnipeg, like I was ma- always making bonus. But, you know, this is when I start seeing the negatives of incentivized pay, right? Because, yeah, being an apprentice, you're going to get the gravy shit, right? You're going to get the breaks and stuff. So it's not hard for me to make bonus, right? And then the the guys above me were getting upset, right? Because I was just knocking jobs. Like when I was young like that, I was, I was pretty fast at, at my job at that time. And I was knocking work out and they were getting pissed off because of course they had to do intakes and they had to do this and that, right? Whereas I'm just hammering brake jobs out left, right and center. Yeah. And uh, so, and then they didn't want to help me. They wouldn't want to teach me things. They, you know what I mean? It was always a burden and seemed like if I had a question. So even though we had a guarantee, it, the flat rate mentality was there. Yeah. Right. Because you still need to make bonus so you can hit that. Cause I think at the time, the, when I was working there in 2003, the mechanics were making 17 bucks an hour. And if you hit bonus, you got bumped up to 23. Right. So, so yeah, I got to see that at that time when I went out to BC, theirs was, was a little bit differently. So they, same thing they had again, and incentivized but there it wasn't just what you put out it's also what the team put out so if the team put out you also got a half you know 50 cent bump a dollar bump dollar 50 bump depending on what it was yeah it's it's funny eh? it's because i mean i spent so many years i never had a modified plan i either worked straight hourly or i worked straight flat rate there was never i've never been on a team plan i've never been on a uh like the last dealership we were at, I was at, excuse me, we had a guarantee, but I mean, they just, there was so many texts and so little work yeah. that almost were always hitting just the guarantee or just a couple hours above it. You weren't like just killing it. Like, I mean, 45 hours was a good week, you know, at, at Nissan because there was just so many texts. Not a, if it wasn't warranty, the customers weren't doing it and it was tough. So I've, the team thing has always left me really, I kind of wish maybe I had tried it or been yeah. on an opportunity to try it, but I hear some horror stories about it too, right? Where you see oh, sure. if you're carrying carrying a team member, yeah. right? Or he's not, or he or she is not necessarily going to be carried, but dragging the average down, then it becomes that person can become a real target, eh? So and I, I think that that's the hardest part for me because generally, like most of the time, in a shop environment, I'm usually one of the harder workers, right? Like I, I, I'm a hustler. That's just how I've always been. And even you'll see me during the tire seat and stuff like that, like my feet move twice as fast, right? I just, I just know this is the time to make money. This is, we got to just move our feet and just do it. Right. So for me to have an incentivized plan that everybody's kind of, you know, benefiting from my hard work, is yeah it's def- definitely hard i think you know and that was the thing is really i was only in an in- incentivized pay plan for i think about three or four years of my career the rest of the time i was always been hourly and there was a couple times i maybe thought about trying the dealership but again there was you know maybe it's misconceptions on my part but i also like the challenges the independent gave you yeah. I liked working on different stuff all the time. I, I just, I couldn't see myself just working on one brand and just like, you know, I remember going to school and I, I was there with two Ford diesel guys, right? And they made crazy money, but all they did was heads, head gaskets yeah. on six liters all yeah. day long, right? I'm like, Ugh. it's like, yeah, great. The money's great. But is that what I want to do? Like, do I want to just do the same thing over and over and over again? Like, yeah. Yeah. So, and, then, and, you know, and for me too, like I, I just got to a point where I love teaching. I love, you know, the apprentices and stuff like that. I lo- it, it's always funny when I do get an apprentice that doesn't want to like learn from me, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, man, I wish I had a journeyman like me that was like willing to just like, like, I love teaching. As you can see from my content, that's just one of the reasons why I'm on TikTok is it's giving me a chance to talk to other mechanics and apprentices and it just like warms my heart when they message me and go hey i don't have a good journeyman i love watching your videos because i'm learning and it's just like for me the teaching thing is so important like it's just i think you know 
Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Do you think the industry right now is really dropping the ball on the mentorship thing? I think so. I think so. And even like, you know, so Manitoba right now, we're allowed to have two apprentices to one journeyman. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and before it was one to one. Yeah. Now the new NDP government that came in, they want to bring that back to one to one. And I'm like, whoa, that is, I think that's a horrible idea especially in our trade. I mean, realistically, like let's say my shop, right? Right now it's just me and I have two apprentices and then we have an older guy that's kind of like part-time, but they're going to be apprenticing under me. Now, if that changes, like who do I decide who I'm going to put through the apprenticeship program and that other guy's just going to have to sit there because we all know finding a journeyman right now is impossible, right? Yeah. And like I'm, we're looking for one right now and, you know, we, we get the odd one. Like we had, we had a guy's, uh, working for us i think a few weeks back again 30 years experience mostly at dealerships and stuff we're like all right give you a chance he shows up and the tools oh my god massive toolbox he had like enough to run a whole shop and we're like okay like some of this has to go like it's, we just we're a small shop right we don't have the room for this but anyways first week on first week on the job and for me because like i'm i get the chance now to run the shop right i'm running the shop the back shop right now and I always like to just watch the guys and just see what they can do before, you know, I want to instill like the way we like to do things. And I'm just watching this guy and we give him a, a Ford escape control arm. Right. And it pays you 1.7, three and a half hours with the alignment. It was, a, there's another job. We gave him two uh, steering knuckles on a Cadillac and it paid you 4.4 to do both of them. Eight hours after the alignment. <laughs> You know, and then there was another thing where he did like a uh, press and wheel bearing on a Jeep Patriot and 45 minutes he fucked with this, the C-clip. Don't get yep. me wrong. There's some shitty C-clips out there, but yep. man, you, you learn quick that you just take the torch out, fucking heat that thing. So you lose, lose the tensile strength and just hammer it out. Like, it's just like, I'm just watching and I'm like, this is, this is brutal. Right. So we talked to him after the first week. We're all like, we just, you know, we see an issue here. Right. Yeah. And it's not so much because it's not like he's walking slow. It's just his process. You just see his process. And it's like at the age he is, it's never going to change. Right. It's just it, this is who he is. That's how it is. And it was just like it was actually a hindrance to us. But like this guy's been in the trade since the 90s. Right. Like, and it's funny because he actually worked at the Nissan dealership that I worked at when I was 16 as a wash bay kid. <laughs> and it's funny. We we're talking. And yet he was a licensed tech at that time. Right. Wow. And it's. But it's like, yeah, he moved, he moved around a lot in his career then by the sounds of it. Yeah. Well, he spent, um, the majority of, uh, his career at that Nissan dealership. It wasn't until the ownership changed that he moved. And then, yeah, he was like, jump, he jumped around a couple dealerships and then, you know, it's funny, even when we were interviewing him, you know, he was saying that some places want to put him on flat rate and he's like, oh, that's not going to work for me here. Da, 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 da. And obviously there's a reason for that because there's no fucking way he'd make money. <laughs> and uh but yeah it was just like but that's the thing sometimes you don't even know what the guy's going to be like until you try it right well and that's we see the talk all the time i see it and i'm sure you've seen it too where guys are talking about they want to do like a working interview yeah. where you know come in for a day two days some guys leave do it for a week yeah. bring a guy on and and you know have a, a kind of a basic tool set for them to work out of yeah. and just start to see how they fit in with the with the staff how they how they do their manage their workflow all that kind of stuff and i think that you know because i can tell you i've moved around a lot and sometimes it takes me a good month before i get really into the groove of you oh, know sure. not fixing the car isn't the problem it's like okay how did i order those parts again how did yeah. uh you know what's the dispatch next what's the process of you know one alignment rack and and four alignment do that kind of stuff like that's where well, i've always Struggle. Well, for sure, but you'll see, you'll see that in the guy, right? When it's when it's not like you know he that was the thing with even this guy. All he kept talking about was like, oh, I understand, I'm slowing the machines. I'm like, I don't care about the machines. Like, I get that that's going to take a while. My issue is the job that you're doing on the car. Yeah. Right. When I see you struggling to do a, and he's like, well, I've never done a Ford Escape control arm. I'm like, well, you're in the independent now. You're going to be seeing that shit all the time, and if you can't even like take your info your, the knowledge you have from doing let's say nissan control arm and apply that to a ford escape we're gonna have an issue here right because we work on a lot of goddamn ford escapes 
Oh, they're such a trash vehicle. I mean, they're money makers, but they probably all rot out where you are too, eh? Really yeah. bad. They're yeah. Just, that- you know what it is? It's, you know, the first generations weren't bad minus the, the rot, but it was the next generations. It was just, they're just so crappy to work on. Oh, so many hoses. They're so tight. Everything's just placed in stupid places. Yeah. Look at that solenoid that on the brand new ones on the two liters, right? Yeah. On two little, the tiny escapes that I call them, right? That are yeah. just like a, smaller than a Nissan Rogue. I did one of them on Thursday and I was cursing because it was higher mileage. It was like a 19. <laughs> but to try and be able to get your hands around that intake to start to push those stupid connections in to oh, get I the. Know. Oh, I was cutting them off and just like I was in the first cycler. <laughs> But away anyway, right? Thank God well, they see the whole new lines and everything. But know, like, but that's the just, thing you can't even change just the purge valve. It has to be a whole goddamn line set up. Like, come on! And you know, this is the funny part. So you see cars like this, and you know, the governments and stuff are all talking about getting rid of single serve plastics and all this. It's like, when are we going to go after the manufacturers with these plastic intakes and the plastic valve covers and all this garbage? Like. <laughs> you know? Go to Wendy's and get a plastic straw, but yeah. you know, the purge solenoid in a Ford and put a hundred equivalent, you know, straws into the lines on it instead of just selling me the one little valve that yeah. push connect on the valve. What? Yeah. How smart would that be? It'd be a twelve minute exchange, you know, of the part. It'd be so simple. It'd probably cost one tenth the price. Yeah. You know, way easier to manufacture. Do they do that? No, no, no. And you know what? You know what the Ford deal, the Ford dealers are doing probably thirteen a day because they're so problematic. Oh, they're terrible! It doesn't seem to matter. They use that same valve on everything, yeah. and all just you're getting with a different part number is a different hose configuration, and it yeah. sucks. Yeah, yeah. I, I hate. I mean, I hate Ford with a passion. It's not that I can't make money working on them or that they're all that difficult to fix. Yeah. It's just quality is. Uh, you know, I mean. If you gave me like a German car to work on or a Ford, it'd be, I'm not sure which. <laughs> I'll still one. take the Ford any day over a German vehicle. <laughs> what I'm doing on the German, right? If I don't have to read that friggin' wiring diagram, then I'd probably yeah. be okay. But you know, that's the, biggest, that's the biggest thing is just the lack of the information to work on the, those cars, right? So, yeah. I, mean, well, I, I, I can fix anything with the right information. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, so how do you find – you're at okay tire. How do you find their training processes and stuff like that? Cause you and I kind of talked about like, you've heard me talk and brag about ASTE and you really want to go, right? Yeah. What's the training programs like for you guys? Nothing really. It's just based on whatever my boss wants to do. Uh, so basically we didn't even become an okay tire till January. So, I mean, we won't, it's been less than a year. So when he took over the business, basically uh, last November, um, it's funny cause like we, we heard like when the place was up for sale, I was at the time I was kind of looking around, right. Cause I'm like, I don't know who the hell is going to buy this business. I don't know what it's going to be like. And for me at the time, see when I moved back to Winnipeg, because I was so upset with the situation that happened in Kelowna, just because I would always leave work so stressed out. And, you know, it was one of those things that there was never any thank yous, but whenever you made a mistake, it was always thrown in your face. Right. So, and my confidence as a technician at the time wasn't there, right? So when I came to Winnipeg, I accepted way less of pay and all this kind of stuff. So I'm like, maybe I'm not worth that, right? right? And then I started working the shop and it was just like, it wasn't a challenging environment, but it was nice. I was five minutes from my house. It was, I never left work unhappy. It was just a good environment in that sense, right? Mm-hmm. But it got to a point, I was there, they working for them for about four years and it just got to a point where it was mediocre you know what i mean there's no advancement in my career there was no so my whole career and everything about it was just blah like it was just like i went to work and earned a paycheck right and it wasn't until i started doing this tiktok thing that really started igniting my love for this industry again because i started talking to again different texts different and uh but then when so when the place was for sale We were hearing in the rumor mill that basically OK Tire was possibly thinking of buying the business or what. What I'm like, Ugh, I don't want to work for a tire shop. Like, right. I like I hate tires to begin with. I don't want to do more tires. I'm gonna do less tires of anything. <laughs> so, but when these when Champ and his business partner Ali came in, it uh, you know the so the first day that they come in, it was funny. I'm like, we need to go upstairs. We need to go talk right now. <laughs> I want, you know, this, I'm like, this is basically what I want. I want to be the head mechanic. If you guys are, you know, and 
I want to be able to run the shop. I want you guys to trust me. And, you know, I want to move my career forward. I want, you know what I mean? Like if you guys are making more money, I want to make more money. I'm tired of making money for people and not seeing those benefits. I will work my ass off for you guys, but I want to see some return on that. Right. And basically I was like, you know, COVID kind of put training out the, out the window for a while. So I'm like, I want to go back to training. If there's training coming, I want to go to training. I want to, you know, all this kind of stuff. So they're like, Hey, yeah, you know what? Like, especially since I came to them with a plan, you know what I mean? I'm like, this is what we need to change to make more money. This is what, you know what I mean? I, I it's not like I just came. I'm like, Hey, I want this and not offer anything. Right. So they're like, okay. Yeah. Let's give, give this kind of, kind of shot. The other, the other guy, the, the other technician that was there, he's been with the company for 17 years, but he kind of wanted to transition to the front. So I said, either me or Joe has to go up front. We know our customers. I think it'd be good for the transition to have one of our faces up there. Right. Yeah. So Joe kind of started moving over the front and I ran the back. Joe never wanted the head mechanic role. You know, even when I came in there, he just like, again, he was a jaded mechanic. <laughs> and, uh, Love this. and even when the apprentices came in, he had one, nothing to do with them. So I said, and I saw my opportunity when they came in and then it was funny. It was like two days after that. They're like, so how do you feel about, you know, do you, if we went to turn to an okay tire and I said, flat out, I'm like, I would, I'd probably leave. I'm not interested. And they're like, oh, well, why? I'm like, honestly, I'm at a point in my career that I don't want to do more tires. I see tire shops, and in the winter time, all they do is tires, like in the tire season. They don't have time to do any other repairs. It's fucking tires, 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 tires. And I just, I don't want to do that. And he's like, no, you know what? We don't have a requirement being an okay tire, right, that we like, we know it's going to bring us more tire business, obviously, but he said, it's not worth it to us to have you do tires, right? It's not cost effective. Mm-hmm. So we'll, so we'll, we'll get an apprentice that, you know, a tire guy and stuff like that. Don't worry. You won't do more tires. <laughs> you still get to do what you you're doing. And uh, I was like, all right, well, I'll give you guys a shot. You know, let's see how it goes. And it was, you know, it was neat because the two guys that bought the shop did know a lick of the industry. Wow. <laughs> they didn't even know what a brake rotor was. Holy so they bought an automotive shop without even knowing what a brake rotor was. <laughs> they're just, you know, they have money. They came from owning some Huskies and stuff like that. So, you know, they had some money and they want to change, change industries. So luckily me and Joe stuck around or else they would have been just hooped. <laughs> hooped. But you know what? The beauty thing about that, what I learned, especially when it's somebody that's, because they're young too, like champ. He's 31, I believe, 32. And, but they're like so willing to learn and listen and like respect my opinion on things because I've been doing it so long. And again, like I said, I learned a lot about the business when I was out in BC. And unfortunately, my last boss didn't even want to hear any ideas. <laughs> you know, like I brought brake servicing. We didn't even service brakes at our shop. Yeah. When I came in, I, I begged him for five years to buy me a brake fluid flush machine. <laughs> like, I'm like, just, just give me one. I'll, I'll sell you brake flushes. I mean, we're sending vehicles out the door with the brake fluids black. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're not even servicing our, our, our customers vehicles properly. We had no flush machines. We had nothing. And so when they came in, I'm like, get me this stuff. I will make you money with it. <laughs> you know? And, and again, it's not about like upselling stuff that you don't need to do, but I mean, you need to flush brake fluid once in a while. I mean, when you do four calipers, it's just better to flush the whole system out and start fresh. 100%. And it's an easy sell. It's not even a hard sell to do. It's finishing the job off properly. That's, I, I find it, isn't it funny though, eh? like how we talk in the industry all the time about some of the old ways of doing things and the old stereotypes of, of what is what is proper to sell and what's ripping the customer off and all this kind of stuff. And I, I'm seeing more and more people that are working for people that are, haven't got a long-term second generation, whatever you want to call it, link to the business. And they seem to be so much more receptive Oh yeah, about what the younger people, and I, we're not young, you and I are not young, but we're not 60 year old shop owners either, right? We're late thirties, early forties, 20 years of mechanics experience. With the input. And I'm, I'm finding that every day it's getting to be where our input is a little more welcome. It's still yeah. a, big obstacle to get through right because everybody's so i don't want to be known as the shop that's the most expensive i don't want to be known as the shop that's ripping people off you know we had a conversation this week about what is what's valuing ourselves right what is what is truly and you know it at the end of the day 
if your customers are satisfied, it doesn't matter about the people that are not your con- customer. Exactly. Their of you. It doesn't matter. You're not, they're not your customers. You're not their shop. It's, it's cool, but we have to start valuing what it is that we bring every day to work. Like you have to value yourself, right? You talked earlier about how you settled for probably less pay than what you should have because you didn't think you were that good a mechanic. And I'm not any kind of superstar, you know, there's like, I'm now check engine Chuck. That guy's you know, super smart. Brandon Sloan, super smart. I'm, but I, after 20 some years of doing this, I've got a pretty refined process of how I solve problems and fix cars. And I'm a bit of a, I can take a bit of an authoritative stance and say, here's a better way to do some things. Mm -hmm. And this is what, when that gets shut down, we don't make any progress in this industry. Right. So yes, that, that, and that's the whole funny part, you know, what, like the neat thing about this whole transition, right. And I was talking to my wife about that the other day was because the old owner was so not receptive to my ideas, right? And said, well, it won't work in our, it won't work here. It won't work here. Our customers aren't like that. You know, because I always talked about like, again, you know how I have a hate for Dorman, <laughs> if you've seen that. But it's just because that's all they ever sold. And we just saw comeback after comeback after come. I'm like, man, we know that this is not going to work as a cam sensor. Why are we not getting from the dealer? Oh, they don't want the deal. How do you know? Did you even try to sell it? Right. So when Champ took over, I was like, hey, this is what we're seeing. I don't want to be putting in cam sensors and, and anything electronic. Let's get from the dealer as much as we can. Amen. Right. And because I'm tired of this, I'm all like, put it this way. I'm like, Champ did put his door rate up a little bit. Right. And but again, I got a pretty big raise when he came in because I demanded it. <laughs> and, and I said, you know what? Let's focus on quality. I'm telling you this right now, Champ, is that. You know, we might lose some cheap customers and that's whatever, but I'm telling you right now, if you, if we can do a quality repair and we stand by it, it doesn't matter what you charge. It doesn't matter what you charge, right? Because I will always go above and beyond for my customers. If there's a new customer, I'll bring them out and I'll show them everything. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm all about honesty. I, there's enough honest work on a vehicle. You don't need to be ripping people off is what I've always said, but what I felt was like the the last owners were, weren't even servicing our customers properly. You know, it's not even about overselling, but if you're not even selling the proper maintenance, you're just not even servicing the customer properly, which at the end of the day, if you service them properly, you're going to make more money. So this whole one year thing is basically champ has followed our mine and Joe's guide guidance. We changed a lot of the stuff that they said wasn't going to work in our shop. And, and guess what? We matched our numbers for last year. Yeah. So, you know, and again, yeah, there was a lot of changes. I mean, we cha- changed to okay tire and all this kind of stuff. But, and of course, I saw some of the customers that wouldn't even give us a shot. You know, I, I always thought that was weird. It's like, you're going to go to a different shop. Wouldn't you at least give us a chance before, <laughs> you know what I mean? But whatever. You know what? We still kept a lot of our customers and we've been gaining tons of new customers. We're building our own rapport, right? So, and I see the nice thing now too, is I get to talk to my customers again, which that like when I was at budget in Kelowna, that was one thing. I'm the one who brought my customers out. I talked to them about everything and the service advisor just sold the job afterwards. Right. Math. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which, and then this is why I always said to Richard, I'm like, which is my old boss. I was like, this is why you're scared to try to sell the better parts. You don't know how to market it properly. I'm like, I've been doing this that way for 15 years i know or 11 years i know how to do it and i know that you're just not communicating properly or you're scared or you don't you just you know what i mean but see the cheap mark the cheap customers i see it all the time when i talk in the groups and whatnot the cheap customers beat them down right they beat them yeah. down where they just make sure. the assumption that everybody is the cheap type of customer exactly and i i struggle with it too because we put some dormant parts on at my shop right oh it's not dormant. It's Napa Advantage, which is still dormant. <laughs> and, and we struggle with it because it's like, well, we offer, you know, we, we'll put a two-year guarantee on the parts and labor. But mm-hmm. the encoder motor, say, as an example, only lasts 13 months. And then yeah. we're doing it for free. What What's the yeah. sense in that? Like, none. You know, yeah. and I could understand that when there were so many OE parts that were unavailable yeah. because of the COVID thing and everything else. And there's still a lot of OE parts oh, that are sure. unavailable. But man, now like I priced it in quarter motor for for a Silverado Sierra, mm-hmm. it was five 
55 cents more money <laughs> at the dealership than it was for the Napa one. I and I would have gotten the only difference you're paying for at that point is warranty, but I'd already had the encoder motor was only 13 months old and it was <laughs> already screwing up again. Right. So it's like the dealer one in the truck that had been in there from the OE lasted 10 years. Right. Let's put another one in that uh, I'm not going to say that the OE replacement is going to last 10 more years, but I bet you it'll last more than 13 months. For sure. And, and a lot of times you'll look at the Dorman price compared to OE. I've even seen Dorman more expensive. Yeah. You know, it's it's the prices aren't that off. Right. And you know what? A lot of times when you tell the customer, even if you have to wait a day, let's say I go, hey, you know, I can put the OE part in, which I know it's going to last. I mean, look at this. You've had it in there seven years. Right. Or I can get you this aftermarket part, put it in today, but from my experience, we've had some issues, right? And that's why we're kind of going this way. Guess, guess how many customers usually say, no, I won't wait. It's yeah. like 5%, maybe, right? Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just funny. It's like I said, it's like I knew all these things from the other shop, and to have somebody tell me that these things don't work, I'm like, well, you're not even willing to try. I'm, how about you let me sell the job to the customer? I'll show you, I'll, I'll, but he would never let me do that. Right. So <laughs> what do you do? I just, is that, you know, is that something you think about? Like I, people have heard me talk in different episodes and everything about my exit strategy, right. From how to get yeah. off the floor to getting, still being in the industry. But you know, this is, this is hard on the body, right? Like you're, I got shoulders and knees and all those that are just like every other mechanic that are starting to hurt. Do you see yourself as like, that's what you want to transition to is in eventually like, not necessarily head tech, but like service manager or service writer. Like, well, well, funny enough, right now, like I said, we're trying to find another red seal, and the whole plan is to get a young enough red seal that, like my my boss, he wants to leave me the business to run. Okay, right. He wants to go to the next thing, right? Which awesome. But for me, it's I don't me just sitting at a computer doing estimates that's just it's a waste of my my skill my talent and all that kind of stuff so where i see myself is running the day-to-day -day, still doing get to doing the diag and the stuff like that that i really love doing right yeah. i mean realistically like it's only in the last let's say four or five years i've been like really really hard and trying to like learn as much learning the scope and like even my last boss didn't give me the opportunities to even work with the scope but my new boss is like, hey, you know what? Use whatever tools you want. Like, And then even when it's slow, I'll bring my truck in and I'll start plugging the scope in. And you know what I mean? Like, I know that, especially when you see people like, you know, Check Engine Chuck and Scanner Danner and all these people in the industry, you know. And I always laugh because my, my one apprentice, Manny, amaz amazing human being, mm -hmm. great heart, but he always calls me the goat, right? And I'm like, I'm not the goat. I'm just some regular guy. Like, it's just, it's just that... You know what I mean? I've I put a lot of my heart into my into my work, mm -hmm. but and yes, I can usually figure out most problems. But like I, 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 I feel like I'm down here compared to those guys. You know what I mean? And but I'm again I'm 38. And I'm like hey, in 10 years from now, imagine where I could be if I just keep applying myself. And you know, it's 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 crazy. Eh? Like you think you're, you know, we always say it's the big fish in the little pond syndrome, right? And then what the beauty of Facebook me was 10 years ago when I started really is like I thought I was at the dealer I was the guy right? I was the guy that figured out I was the guy that made you know, solve the problems and so on and so forth then you start to network with these other people that like either work at a bigger dealer than you and see a lot more cars or they work at the independent side where they work on anything and everything and then you work you see you get to talk to people like a Chuck mm -hmm. that are doing mobile solving they don't know what the heck to expect when they get to the next car all they've got is a phone call saying it won't crank and you realize man i don't know <laughs> right and that's like you know we had paul danner's episode drop this week right and yeah i, I just listened to that a few days ago yeah. super guy isn't he he's yeah. just and you know it's the, it's the running joke but i mean this industry is so lucky to have the social media platforms now where people are going out and sharing training methods and, and processes and stuff, because there's this stuff moves so fast. There's no way you can keep up on no. it. Like the, no, and especially like my boss, like now he, he wants to get into the EVs and the hybrids, like, which I'm all for it. Honestly, like, again, I, 
I don't worry about the politics behind it. That's whatever. Yeah. For me, as a person that loves technology and stuff like that, it's it's neat. It's something new to learn. I mean, there are benefits to it. I mean, they're clean to work on. Very very little fluids. Lots of room to work on, and they're easy once you know them. Like mm-hmm. it's it's straightforward. You're not going to be rebuilding the motors anyways, right? You'll, if you find a motor issue, you'll just plop in a whole new electric motor and or a whole new battery pack. You're you're not going to be just changing cells out of it because it's not it's not effective, you know. And I yeah. like, I, like even this year, my boss sent me out to BC BC there for a week to do the EV course at BCIT, and that was just like it was amazing. Yeah, like yeah. I, if I could be in school and make money, I would love it. I just love learning, you know. And it's it's you're dealing with the EV stuff. You're dealing with the, the I want to say the higher disposable income kind of customer, right? Where right. you know a four hundred dollar ticket or an eight hundred dollar ticket doesn't break them. You know, it doesn't mean that they don't pay their rent that month, right? They're yeah. it's, oh, it's eight hundred bucks, okay, or a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars. Like it's not you see it, right? It's t- look at the price of tires, it's twelve hundred bucks. They're oh, know. you know, yeah. Four tires for an Equinox. Like I priced yeah. them a month, thirteen hundred dollars for some Pirellis for my mom's Equinox. Yeah. I can remember when four tires for that same type of car, eight hundred bucks. Yeah. You know, installed. So I mean, when we see now with everybody struggling so much, I think the EV thing, and I don't love <laughs> the idea of it, but mm-hmm. I mean, I understand why so many because it is they are for the most part are pretty reliable. Um, you're dealing with a type of customer that certainly has the money to be able to, should have to fix it. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be something that if you can offer it to your customer base is going to push you to the next level in exactly. your demographic, right? A lot of people don't want to get into it and yeah. it's going to be, you know, we've seen, um, my buddy Lucas uses the term all the time, the barrier of entry, right? Which is going to be, what's going to be the one thing that's going to start to push some shops to just closure instead of advancement. And I, he believes 100% that it's going to be the EV because you know, a lot of people just don't want to invest. They don't want to tool tooling's one of those things. That's kind of what started this whole conversation this weekend, right? It is, it's such an expense, you know, uh, the auto off feature that you've got to have just to be able to go in and look at a secure gateway vehicle, right? To clear the codes. Are you running into obstacles at your shop or are you guys pretty, uh, we got auto off this year because I was starting to run into those issues. Funny enough, it was, <laughs> it was because of guys with, with rams that they were throwing diesel in their goddamn rams. And then I couldn't even, like, I couldn't even act, activate the relays anymore to pump the goddamn shit out. And, uh, but, you know, yeah, we got auto off this year because, again, it's just, it's one of those things that something simple like using your scan, it's not that expensive. At the end of the day, I think it was, like, 60 bucks for the whole year. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? And if you and, have a on tool, it's already part of your yeah. subscription right. to yeah. your software. So, I mean, and as we, long we, we charge shop supplies, that's what that shit should go towards, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, I mean, I would love it back in the day. I can remember, you know, every RAM when they first came out needed an EGR valve and used to just be able to, you know, go out, scan it in the parking lot, chuck the EGR valve in, clear the PC, reset the memory, gone, done. Now there's a whole process where it's like, oh, cool. So you can get the code out of it. You have to read it on the generic side, but you can't clear the code. No. The idea that, you know, people don't want to invest in that tooling or haven't yet to be able to serve that customer. And then they want to gripe about what somebody that is forced no. to. And I don't, I'm not trying to kick this hornet's nest again. That was, that was. <laughs> Like I'm, it's hard for me to wrap my head around because I mean my yeah. own personal tool, my own Snap on Zeus, does yeah. it, yeah. and I'm not I'm not a shop owner, right? I'm just mm-hmm. a tech, so my own tool does what they need it to do, and I'm sitting there going, "Well, what do you have for tooling then if you don't even have that? How are you well, getting? Know, and if you if you can't even tr- pay pay for the fifty dollars for the subscription to hook your tool up to it, I mean, like, yeah, it's I, such a small cost. Yeah, and it's I get it. I love Norm's. I love Norm. Norm's a you know, great guy. I mean, I love all you guys, but I mean, he, he has some fantastic perceptions on this, but the reality is, is that like, we might have to tighten our belts a little bit figuratively with what we, what we charge and what we do and how we operate our businesses, because this tech is going to move so fast that if we don't get ahead of it and we don't figure out our processes and, and update them, we're not going to be able to be competitive. 
you know, because sure. the dealership, it's like I mentioned, they got no, they have no choice. It gets sent to them. They get build it. And the guys are forced to go on training and they use it. Us that sit out here in the aftermarket, we can pick and choose a little bit, but your customers ultimately dictate what it is that you're going to need yeah. to have. And if you choose not to have it, that's again, you're right. Yeah. But we, we can't run down the other shop that has it, especially when we need everybody in this industry to be working together. I've said it so many times. There's so many more problems that we could get ourselves out of if we just sublet it to somebody more equipped. Well, yeah, and, and see, that's what's happening with us with programming, right? We, we've Not that I don't want to program, right? I would love to learn that. But when you look at the value, you know what I mean? The cost and how, like, again, if I was bad at diagnosing, I'd probably find more PCM issues <laughs> where I would need to reprogram more PCM. But honestly, I maybe do two, maybe three reprograms in a year. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's not always going to be a GM. Sometimes it's going to be a Ford or it's going to be a, yes, I know I can buy the subscription just for, you know, the three days or whatever it is. But when I look at how much, you know, buying a J box and then getting a laptop and you know what I mean? Doing all this kind of stuff. And then the whole like rigmarole of actually learning to do it. Is there any value in that? Right. Whereas we have a mobile guy that comes right to our shop charges 250 bucks to reprogram you know what we pass it on to the customer comes in flashes our thing and no headache on us and it's done right uh if we start seeing more of it maybe at that point but again we're a small shop right at, at what point do you decide okay i want to do this but i don't want to do you know what i mean and so again even tra transmission work i remember you uh you just i listened to one of your podcasts i think it was your first one and the guy was talking about how he sublets the tra transmission workout, yeah. right? And we do the exact same thing. I mm -hmm. do not touch a trans. I'll diagnose it, but yeah. I won't pull it out. I won't do any of that thing. We send it to the tranny shop, and we make 400 bucks, I think, on it. Yeah. Don't have we'll to do it. Don't have to work with war warranty, none of that stuff, right? Yeah. I'll I'll pull I mean, we're not even to the point anymore locally where a lot of the new, like, like the ones that Brendan talks about, but Brendan's doing all day long, right? The six, eight, and the 10 speeds. We don't, I want to say this. When I tried to take a, I think it was an eight or a 10 out of an express to our local guy, uh, he couldn't even get parts to rebuild it, he said. <laughs> so it sat at his shop for 10 days before he called us and said, hey, I can't get parts for this. We literally picked up the phone, called the dealer. The dealer's like, okay, I'll have one tomorrow, which was unusual because for a while they were order but then it's like so we've how had that thing pushed outside leaking transmission fluid all over the pavement for 10 days to, to back in the shop to to jam the 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 rebuilt right in the rebuilt's not got a warranty right i have to then truck it over to the dealership to get the relearn done and, and the programming yeah. adjust but it's done you know yeah. the customer gets a warranty on of it i'm not liable for anything that happens after the fact you yeah. know what i mean it's just as long as anything that was involved in the in the re and reprocess is good mm -hmm. not. so trannies to me yeah it's i'm i'm thinking it's going to become even more specialized like when i did my oh, term sure. at nissan it's like you might as well this customer comes in and you know what it is it's a nissan it's it's, it's crap you might not, not even bother looking i feel for a replacement unit unless you're really really willing to be able to get the software out of the old unit do the rewrites do the reprogramming because otherwise you can jam that sucker in it's not going to last six weeks and it'll tear itself up yeah. right you don't do the programming on it so what are you really doing by you know putting that unit in and telling the customer okay i got it in it's not going to really shift right you got got to go <laughs> to the deep you know here's a vin tag off your old case take that yeah. to them and say hey make these two work customer doesn't have time for that you know you might better like if you're going to do the job, you might better have the car until you set the appointment up with the dealer. You truck it over there, tow it over there, drive it over there, do whatever yeah. you want, have them do it, or just refer the customer to them in the first place. And that's what sucks. But you know, some of us for so many times, as we've had these conversations, when I was at the dealer, somebody had to sublet something to me. I saw how they treated that customer in the sense that they tried to steal that customer from a shop like yours or a shop like mine. Yeah. I only really get where they're coming from. I mean, it's a dog eat dog industry. Oh, for sure. But you know, if more and more, if we had like how I want to handle it is I want to say, okay, I'm going to have the customer's car this date. I'm going to make the appointment. I'm going to get in. I'm going to take the car over. I'm going to leave it and I'm going to pick the car up. 
I don't want my customer going into my competitor's office, you know, because. Oh, like, that's why all our sublets we take care of. Yeah. Right. And it's just, I, I definitely believe in that. Like, just like glass. We have a glass guy that comes right to our shop and changes windshields for us. Right. Like we are a full stop automotive shop. Doesn't mean that we're personally doing all the work ourselves, mm-hmm. but we will take care of you. Right. Are, are uh, you- just like, just like I had a Toyota matrix that we needed to uh, put a new PCM in. Same thing. I need to go to the dealership. Well, we took it to the dealership, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't like sending anybody to a different shop themselves. Are you finding ADOS to be an obstacle yet? For you guys? No, not at all. No, I know it's, you know, we went to the courses and all that kind of stuff. But I haven't. Realistically, right now, we're just start even with our alignments, we're, we're just starting to see the vehicles with ADOS. I mean, I know that they're, we're probably not taking the precautions and, you know, recalibrating the things that we really should be all the right. time. Yep. Uh, I am fully aware of that. Just like how they always say you should always, you know, recalibrate your um, steering angle sensor when you do an alignment. I mean, how many shops actually do that, right? Yeah. And will it cause a problem? I'd say 99% of them won't, but it's that 1% that might bite you, right? Yeah. And so, unfortunately, it's going to where more and more it's becoming an even more critical, you know, yeah. in that, that angle sensor, right? It used to not be, but yeah. now with lean departure and all that jazz, it's, it's a huge thing, right? It's yeah. like, you know, the oxygen sensor used to be not that big a deal in, you know, 1989. Yeah. Now it's, <laughs> right? I, yeah, we're around my area. We're not, we're not seeing it a lot, you know, no. uh, but I mean, I know when I worked at the dealer, uh, we had a recall on the on the on the sensors on the Nissans. Like they were, we were doing five and six of them a day, and having to set up targets and, you know, it was it was such a a bunch of shenanigans because these, and then you'd put them in, and then the parts that they gave you under the recall, they're recalling those parts, and so on. it's like the four door latches thing, right? And it's just like, when are you guys going to finally get this right? You know, oh, like yeah. customers that are just cranked up, and I look at it and go. Once that sucker's out of warranty, if it's not under warranty and it's not a recall, those customers are not fixing it. To no. me, it's like a TPMS later. Or- oh, <laughs> those are those are the funniest. <laughs> you know, you got a guy that comes in with a blown tire, and it's like, oh, I don't know how that happened. I'm like, well, how long is your tire? Oh, that thing's been on for months. I'm like, and you just didn't think of checking. He's like, oh, I just thought it was just an warning light. It's just like warning lights mean nothing. Just like the you know, it was the last week we had a, a girl come in with a Kia. 13,000 mm. kilometers overdue her oil change and her her motor's just knocking. Her oil light comes on, it's ticking away, and she says she would, you know, oil light came on, didn't stop her. Didn't, she kept driving until it stopped, right? Luck she didn't blow the motor. But mm. I'm, I'm looking at this, and then my, you know, I talk to Champ, and he's like, yeah, I was talking to her. She's like, yeah, I just didn't don't know how to maintain my vehicle properly. I'm like, your, check, your oil change light for the last 10,000 kilometers has been going hey change the goddamn oil <laughs> and you don't know how like, just listen to your car your car yeah. will tell you well, the radio to what <laughs> like, what doing it? i didn't hear it right on the way yeah. that's the thing everybody says hyundai and kia are junk but i mean honestly think about how many engines that we've heard the stories <laughs> they've changed out just because they've neglected them to the oh, point yeah. what, they have right? to have the, some of the worst worst owners is what it comes down to I even had a, a girl two years ago, 60,000 kilometers. She bought a brand new, never changed the oil. By the time it came in, obviously the motor seized up. And it was like, just gunk, just gunk. She didn't even know an oil change was a thing. I'm like, how do you spend $20, $25,000 on a vehicle and not know like basic maintenance? <laughs> well, because they're not, they're not taught it in school though anymore, right? Like, I, I mean, you go about it. And it's, you know, it's not a gender thing. Cause I mean, I've yeah. talked, equally both people just oh, yeah. my own brother right if i didn't have ever explain to him uh, how critical this stuff was uh, you, you know he, he he runs over his oil interval all the time my mother uh, does the same thing it's almost like they're spoiled and i know my, my family's horrible for that same with with, with my wife's family and I, I give him shit all the time it's like because at the end of the day who's the one who's going to be changing the motor for them, right <laughs> hopefully not us i <laughs> I, I really like Kias and Hyundai's. I mean, honestly, when they come in, when they're fixed, they drive not bad. I mean, they're they sell a pretty good car for the price. Pretty easy to work on. Super easy to work on. Oh, you look at a you Kia know what I mean? and you compare it to like an Equinox or a, a crew. Look, 
is a Chevy Cruze better than? <laughs> Don't even get me started on those POSs, <laughs> right? Jeez. No, no, it's not. You know, no. a Hyundai or Kia is better built than a Chevy Cruze, any one. But yeah. yet, you get this this you know terrible reputation, and it's like people are and. A cruise is, I don't care what, you can maintain the hell out of a cruise. It's still going to constantly leak, break, and you're going to put a turbo in it. You're put, like, just not. It's, it's either burning oil or leaking oil. <laughs> Look at the brand new escapes of the two liter, right? Coolant yeah. intrusion in the block. Oh, oh this fire, put an engine in it. Put yeah. a cylinder head in it. Like, at least put the cylinder head in it and look, oh, look. Well, we got it off. We can see it's leaking past the cylinder wall. Like, how do you cast an engine block that won't even keep the coolant out of the cylinder? How well, do you do that? I, uh, it's, like the, it's like the new Broncos there with their valves get hardening up and break. Like, how does it go through all that R and D, and you don't discover that before it goes out? Same with the Chevys and their lifter issues. And st- like, you guys have been having a- lifter issues since AF- AFM has come come into the place. Your old, your old blue Chevy. That's pre that stuff. Isn't oh yeah, ninety nine. That's the first year of the of the five three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you could, <laughs> I worked on a ton of six liters in an ambulance fleet, and they, yeah. you know, none of that nonsense either. That AFM garbage. Right? And it's oh no, the the five three and the six liters before before active fuel management. That is a great great motor. Mm-hmm. I don't care what you say. I've seen so many of those come in with six hundred plus thousand kilometers i mean mine my truck has three hundred and seventy thousand. and the 140 i put out were not easy at all especially up in bc i used to beat the absolute piss out of that thing i'm I'm obviously like a i'm a chrysler dodge jeep guy from way back i mean but and and people they get ripping on the the pentastar and they get ripping on the hemi but i mean really if you do the maintenance you if you treat it like it is which is in canada's extreme service interval you know, and you, and you change your oil at 5,000 kilometers and use a decent synthetic oil. Lifters and rockers are not as big a thing. But half yeah. these guys, they show them they're doing one. And it's like you can tell by the color of the metal that that sucker has been cooked. You know, it's yeah. been reheated. It's been sludged up. Like, well, what do you expect? You know, like. I mean, that's even with the Fords. I mean, that's one of the big issues, the phasers and stuff. It's, it's, the, it's the maintenance. Every one that I've taken apart that's had timing chain and phaser issues, like it's cool. Everything's golden brown and black inside of it. You know what I mean? So, yes, they're complicated systems. Don't get me wrong. But the guys that maintain these things, they last, right? Mm-hmm. Especially certain years. Certain years of those Fords are great trucks if you maintain them properly. Yeah. But, so, what do you... Like you're, you're pretty big on social media, obviously. Do you think that it's been good for, for the industry to get as many of these conversations happening? Or do you think it's been kind of like, cause you, you hear some people, you know, talk about it's toxic, you know, or it's, um, it gets to be into a dick measuring contest. Right. And, and a lot of people that you see me, we, we've talked yeah. about the, the DIY thing. Right. Yeah. And we had that conversation like, you and I are kind of on the same page about that, but it's that's a that's a not a popular topic, right? No. <laughs> Talk about what the, what the industry is doing and what the social media does to the industry. Do you I, think it's been the, for the best, or I think it's a little bit of both for that way. So where I like it again is the conversations and the community that gets built up, right? I mean, since I've started TikTok, I mean, now if I run into like. You know, good example was that Ford I did last year, and it was uh, it came in for an issue with the shift like the four wheel drive shift solenoid. That was the code, right? And when I tested, there was no ground going to the solenoid, so I go back to the module, no ground on the module. I'm like, well, fuck, it has to be the module. I'm like, that's the only thing that makes sense, right? And so I did a video on it, and it's just like, of course, some guys are like, oh, you're a fucking idiot, and you know, you shouldn't be testing that if you don't. I'm like, well let me know what, what did I do wrong? Right. And then this one rich got he, 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 he got out to me. He's like, watch this video. And when they changed it, I think it was 2019, 2018, where you have to drive these things now for yeah a mile or mile and a half before that, the, the four wheel drive module will actually send the ground signal to the solenoid. Mm-hmm. So, but it'll give you a solenoid code. And then what I ended up finding was, yeah, it was one of the actuators on the freaking wheel that's giving you a solenoid code. But I thought it was the solenoid because there's no ground going to it. But this is the beauty thing is, you know what? I, that one video saved that customer a module. 
and a misdiagnosis on my part, right? So I ended up doing the update on the module anyways, because they even in the TSB, it says, you know, first thing you should do regardless is put the newest update in there. And then uh, and that's when I found the actuator issue, right? But it's, it's, it's that end of it that I really, really like. I like how all these mechanics with all these different experiences can get together and help each other solve these issues because you and I both know within a city, like no shop wants to help another shop. We just see each other as competition and you know, unless you have a buddy that's working here, there, like good luck. You, I'm not going to call, you know, the, the local Ford dealership here and talk to, you know, Joe nope. Blow there. He's not going to give me any, he's going to be like, Hey, just ship it over here. I'll fix it for you. Right. Yeah. And I can so, remember when you used to be able to phone, <laughs> you know, the independent shop and you bought a certain amount of parts from, you know, the parts yeah. department dealer, you might be able to call the parts department. I've done it years mm-hmm. ago. Nobody wants to help you, like you said, anymore. Nobody even answers the phone and say, hey, can I talk to one of your techs for a minute? Yeah. Now I find it is so much easier if I'm networking with so many more people to be able to say, hey, Rich, or, you know, you know, hey, Mark, or, have you guys run into this kind of stuff? Because yeah. none of us know everything. And that's the thing is like everybody's like, well, did you read the damn service information? Well, there's a whole lot of stuff that's not published in the service information. And even when it is, if you've got an hour, an hour and a half, maybe allotted to diagnose and repair, or at least diag, you can spend that ninety minutes just trying to learn how that system works. Well, and for sure, like this Ford, I mean, they've been doing it a certain way for fifteen plus years, so you just never even think of going to the service information, right? Because it's like you didn't know that they changed the protocol on that because it's again they've been doing it this way for fifteen years. It was an e- like I. How many Fords have we fixed the solenoids and vacuum lines and actuators and all this kind of stuff, right? It's, it's, you know, so I didn't even think about looking at service information. I, I know that that's one of the first things they always say, always look, no matter what it is, go look at service. But something like that, you're like, this is something I've done a million times. I don't need to worry about it, right? And they don't put it in a big red flag <laughs> in service information saying, hey, Mark, yeah. last yeah. year we we'll do it like this. This year and going forward, we're going to do it like that. If they yeah. just little paragraph that was like a big shiny red arrow look here look here I, I i wouldn't be so befuddled so many of the time right but well, i mean exactly. they, it's it's like they just make the assumption that everybody that's reading the service information has been a guy at the dealer that's taken his you know quarterly training and the quarterly training shows them the updates and it's like okay because i've sat through those classes you remember how they all used to do you know <laughs> like came and crank sensors yeah okay so now we've gone to a different type of crank so if you don't sit through that class yeah. you're not going to know that right yeah. like it's you're going to figure it out on the first couple that you do that whoa wait a minute this is not the same but yeah well, so that key i worked on the other day if i didn't go read the service information it sends a 3.3 volt signal to you know the tranny that's what it uses a 3.3 volt well you're always so used to five volt references. You see 3.3 volts. You're like, well, shit, something has to be wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. but, so no, I see that the networking as positive, but I do see the toxic end of it. Right. I mean, you get the trolls and the, you know, just people that just want to ruin your day. Cause they just suck in life. I don't know what it is. Right. And no matter what you do, no matter what you say, they have to like be against you. Right. So I, I see that end of it, but the, the toxic parts that I see is just the, the ones that just want to, again, do the mudslinging and the giving bad advice or, or, you know, calling this guy a hack because he does a different, you know what I mean? It, that I've always said you can put 10 mechanics in one room, you're yeah. going to get 10 different ways to, to do the job. But it doesn't mean that that guy's a hack or this, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, we just, our brain might process that problem differently. As long as you get to the end result and it's a quality repair, it doesn't matter how you get there. Yeah. I, right? I, I see you know, like I got to meet Rich at ASTE, right, this year. And he's such a cool guy when you meet him in person. He's yeah. he's very much just like he is. But you see him once in a while, like we see him online and he's always, you know, <laughs> talking back to somebody that's trolling him or he's gonna set somebody straight. When you when you are with that guy and he's just like we're just having fun and we're just having a conversation. He's a super cool guy, but I mean, such a sharp. Well, like, even me and Richard had had a little like situation there, right? Where and I just said, "Come on, Rich." I'm all like, you know, me and you are two very opinionated people. Right? He's like, "Yeah, but you should." Do-. I'm like, "You go after guys all the time." I'm like, "Yeah, but it's like that's because they deserve it." And blah blah. blah. I'm all like, 
this guy was being a dick. Like I, I honestly, I don't call people out over my social media unless they're being freaking dicks, right? Yeah. And it's just like, I mean, I've always been an antagonist my whole life, but I know that trying to build up my brand and like putting my, you know, okay tire and all that kind of stuff, I don't want to just attack people and look like look like this, you know, this this guy. But at the same time, if you're being a real big dick i use it kind of also as a learning experience you know what i mean just like the video i just put out today with the whole it was one from last year you know where i you know again i know your your thoughts on flat rate and i have my thoughts on flat rate and stuff but my biggest issue is when guys can't do the simplest job on a vehicle to get the quality repair because they can't get paid for it right and then when they're just being such dicks about it my i'll point it out and I'll be this is these are my issues with it why because cleaning a rim let's say even if it cuts into your into your time you're going to make it up on the next job and and what you want that that tire to go flat or you want the wheel to fall off like I just I just don't get that mentality right especially it's the 30 second job on a goddamn rim and if you're if you're that slow you still can't make money on a tire you know like that's I I, I tell I'll tell you where that mentality comes from. And it's not me defending the way it happens, but I was that guy. I'll, I'll go back to breaks as an example, right? Because we it seems to be the one thing you put 10 guys in a room and 10 guys do oh, yeah. a job. <laughs> but I was that guy that everything was like cleaned, lubed, you know, and then I got paid the one and a half for uh, pads and rotors on the front and, and they got paid and they would do theirs in 15 minutes. It was literally like yeah. chuck off, throw everything back on. <laughs> The hubs didn't get clean. The the back of the rim didn't get clean. Nothing got clean. The saddles didn't get cleaned. It, nothing got lubed back on. I'd be over there like grinding and grinding and grinding. The the attitude comes from at the end of the year, he'll do a thousand more brake jobs than you. And, you know, at a 1.5 per, that's a substantial kick in, in pay. So I understand where the attitude comes from, but that's where I want to see it change. And Exactly. And that's, that's, that's where my problem is, is because you are, it's, it's, if you do the job properly, it can bite into you feeding your family. Yeah. Like you know it, what I mean? Brandon is such a cool guy. And I, I don't know if him and I are still going to be friends after this whole week, how this, that's all gone down. But I mean, when you <laughs> see him, how he approaches a transmission, mm-hmm. right? There's an, another guy out there that's approaching it the way he is, that he's putting it out there <laughs> where it's at engineering level. Like he's not just rebuilding it, right? He's making it better. Every one that he does. Yeah. There's, there's so many of us that aren't doing that and I'm not saying we all have to do it, but you know, it's, or when I watch rich, how rich understands how to break down the system on a Ford to where he can show you, you know, just like you said, that example, we need, we need to be able to keep the, the conversations going and being open and, and everybody not get so offended and so hurt. If somebody calls you out on a better way to do something, because yeah. You can defend your method of why you do it, and you don't have to. When you click the computer off, you're not forced to do it the way Mark does it or the way I do it or Brendan does. But you gotta be open minded to hear why the other person does it, and that's what I when I see Rich and he's constantly he gets trolled so bad, you know. Just you see the guys and you know the comments. You see them too. I see them. They don't even work in jobs that have no friggin' clue what they're talking about. They're just disgruntled. You know, like you, you laugh, but I, I keep saying that, you know, the favorite flavor of crayon is salt because <laughs> that's what they are. Is there are a lot of people that are just like, they're, they're, they're bad at the industry. They're not working in the industry. They're mad at the industry from a customer standpoint. And I long ago didn't even give a crap. You know, I'm not on here networking to try and make the customer experience, you know, because you're never going to satisfy them all. My goal has always been to get us on a on an on an even playing field, get us where we're sharing information and supporting one another. Because at the end of the day, that makes the customer's experience way better than me trying to constantly defend what it is I have to charge for doing. Yeah, because but, uh, but, yeah, I was gonna say, but along those to- that that same topic, you know, and this is where I've even changed as a, a mechanic doing this content i would say my first year i was very standoffish you know where i you know thought that maybe my but you know what i started i started stepping back whenever somebody called me out on something let's say they said oh you know the way you're doing it's not you know i start just thinking i'm like 
hey, you know, maybe my way isn't because at the end of the day, you're only as good as what you've learned or what you've been taught, right? Yeah. So when somebody calls me out, I'll go and do, even if I think I'm 100% right, I'm like, you know what, let's let's go look at it and I'll spend that night researching this and I'll read so much about it. So then the next day, if, I, if, if I'm going to go after you, <laughs> I'm going to make sure that I'm going to bring the receipts yeah. and I'm going to prove why my way is better than your way. And if you still think you're better than me, then you're just the freaking idiot you know and it, it's it's was like, the best. You know, it came down to the tire patching thing now i start balancing all my tires it, i was you know, say that isn't it? this podcast has been the best thing for me to help my attitude in terms of not because i used to be i used to be awful i used to just <laughs> roast somebody right yeah. i used to snap judgment immediately on what they were who they you know and and then just roll with it and what I, the podcast has taught me is that it's like a, it's not good for the brand, even if you are right, right, yeah. to constantly ham them. And yeah. B, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You know, they have a customer base and a clientele that they have and they've built. And I'm not interested in stealing that customer base from them. I just want to just all be more respected and more appreciated and paid better. That's what I want. 100%. So getting and fighting with, you know, somebody about how they do something, especially yeah. with another professional. I've never been about that, right? I've always been like, if you're a disgruntled customer, I don't even care. You know, you're in, you're in the mechanics of TikTok, trolling Rich or trolling Brandon or trolling <laughs> me. I don't care. You're just like, you're grouchy because you can't fix it yourself and you're mad because it costs a lot of money. Exactly. I understand, but I mean, like, I'm not going to enable you. But when I see other techs out there and it's like, they're they're challenging you know, Rich or, or you or myself or somebody on how to do something. I'm like, so what's your credentials? Why do you do it that way? And if they've got nothing, then kindly, politely bow out of the conversation and let the men talk. <laughs> the, the best is when people try to come at me about break work. I yeah. mean, I've worked in a break shop 14 years in my career. I know breaks better than most people. Same with exhaust. Like I've, I used to build a high end, like, uh, hot rods and stuff like that. Like custom bending was my thing. When I came to Winnipeg, I was like, I don't want to do exhaust anymore. I, pff, I'm done. I've done it my whole career. Now I miss the custom aspects of it. I hate hanging a muffler, but like the custom work, I have, mm -hmm. I miss that every day because you know what? Not everybody can do it. Yeah. There's very few pipe benders out there anymore, and it was just like, especially like you know, you get an old, an old Bel Air or some of that. Like it's yes, it had to be in a certain area, but it was your own like it was almost like an art form you know yeah. what i mean like and yeah. and the thing was about that kind of work was there's people that want to spend money on their cars and when they saw it you know it's just that it was that when they saw it and just the, how happy they were that they were dropping a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks for me to build some and they were just so, so proud of the job you know it was because there's a lot of ungrateful parts of our job nobody wants to come see you nobody's happy when their vehicle breaks down but the hot rodders oh my god those those were the best customers it's like they wanted to spend money but they wanted it to be good and when it was good oh they it was and it was neat going to the car shows and be like oh i you know i built that one i built that you know it, it was cool uh so that i do miss i do i never thought i'd miss any part of the, the exhaust business but custom bending 100 percent. especially when i see the crap that comes out from other shops sometimes we sublet i'm like oh my god like just let me go over there and bend it myself like <laughs> i just i just i have so much pride in my work that i it just bugs me like <laughs> when you we, see we talk at my shop all the time because we do a, a fair bit of exhaust repair and then it's like you look at the quality of the walker stuff and it's like oh i'd rather <laughs> I'd rather weld a flange onto the OE piece and leave the OE metal in there than put that Walker crap on because it's not even going to last two years, you yeah. know? And you make a good point about the brake thing. I laugh at the guys that it's like, well, my friends in South Carolina or North Carolina, <laughs> they do break, it's, they're not doing it wrong. But I mean, I'm like, you just, yeah. chill when they talk about the rust that they have on their brackets, right? Like yeah. on, on their saddles. And it's like, we, we throw it in the blast cabinet and you're in there an hour getting well I, I laugh at the southern guys that that always comment on my uh heating up front end parts they're like you shouldn't be putting heat on a front end part i'm like okay then how the hell do you fix cars out in the north like good luck <laughs> could you imagine never putting heat on a front end we're not changing the whole goddamn thing and even then you wouldn't be able to get the old stuff out 
every everyone would need a steering rack at 2020. By 2023, you'd need a steering rack because you wouldn't be able to do a toe adjustment unless you take foot yeah. it. Like, yeah. I get where they're coming from, and I understand. Yeah. But it's like, and I, yeah, okay, so yeah. you heat that up. That changes the metal composition of the, yeah. of the jam nut, but it's a jam nut. You know, yeah. like, a, if you really wanted to be secure, yeah. I could then throw a stitch of weld on that jam nut up against the tie rod. It ain't coming off. You know, I'm going to back off. Like, it's not going to crack. It's not going to break. It's, I don't want to run down people for how they do things different than me. I merely want to understand better why they do it that way. And if they can get away with doing it, if it's, if their, if their environment and their shop, whatever it dictates it, cool. But when people like, you don't have to clean a hub before you put a rotor on or you don't in the back of a rim. If you if you really want to get the internet fired up, what you do is you post a video about cutting off a wheel bearing off of off of a CV shaft. My goodness, yeah. I've never had so many angry trolls and people. I'm I'm a mechanic in New York for thirty years. I've never had to. You're 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 obviously a hack. And I'm like, okay, well, it's not coming out. I got on my twenty ton press. It ain't coming out. What's your next step, bud? Exactly. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I haven't cut a, a whole lot of wheel bearings off, but I've definitely had to cut a couple of wheel bearings right off the freaking axle. Just I, it is what it is. I had a donor that fought me like six months ago, and it was literally like by the time we were done, we were putting the TV back and the bearing in it because it yeah. was so seized together that I literally had to cut the bearing out of the knuckle, yeah. just the CV shaft, so I could get the CV shaft out. Yeah. Yeah. Your side, right? The one with the bracket on the back of the engine, whole thing, the expensive one. And, you know, at the end of the day, the customer was not impressed because he'd done the wheel bearing on the driver's side himself and had it, of course, came apart. He had no issues. He started doing his passenger side at home and he had to get it towed into the shop. And, you know, he's like, I don't understand why this one's so difficult. And I'm like, I don't know either. I wish I could tell you why the other side came apart so easy for you because I'm looking like I really don't know what I'm doing now because uh, I'm cut this apart. <laughs> And you probably tack, you know, tapped on the driver's side. My theory is maybe the driver's side, it's not the original one. It's already been changed once. So, but at the end of the day, I can't, I can't control what comes apart in my hand. I mean, there's methods, but if it's seized up in Canada, it's seized. Oh, you yeah. know, we see the guys that they fight with, you know what it's like, the Ford ones and the Subarus, right? The wheel bearings and post knuckles. You're just, you're, you got to be up front and say to your customer, well, this is where we could be going, you know, like, and, and if they don't like that, well, take that down to one of your Southern mechanics in Florida, drive down there, take a holiday and see if they can get it out because I'd see it's just a different world. Right. So. Oh yeah. I, it's just like when we do press and bearings, we always recommend uh, a sensor because yeah. I mean, most of them won't come out. Same when we do struts. A lot of times we'll, if they're attached with a sway bar link, we'll recommend the links because we all know that some of them won't come out. And once you start heating up a sway bar link, I mean, there goes, there goes the, the, the plastic bushings and whatever. Are you putting the cam bolts in the front of struts? Funny enough, I used to a lot, mm -hmm. uh, especially the days before quick struts. Like, so my last shop, we did a lot of like basically the, out there it was ICBC, so there was like the, the provincial run insurance company, but I did a lot of the ICBC alignments, right? So you had to have it in the green. So I did a lot of cam bolts. And again, this is before quickie struts and all that kind of stuff. But since since the quick struts have been around, I mean they, they seem to fix a lot of those camber issues that we've that we have after doing a set of struts. Yeah. And like, but I've done I a do lot. do the odd cam bolt, but no, it's it's not as common as I used to do them, that's for sure. I've run into a lot more alignments lately where I can put that airbag up in there, fill it right up, and I can get it to come in to green, but I, I can't get that bolt tight enough to lock it where it'll stay in the green, you know, and, and the air goes away and the, and the camber comes right back into the red again. And you're always just, just off, you know what I mean? Like, and it's, it's frustrating, dude. It's, str it stresses me right out because it's like <laughs> that it's off, but I mean, it's like the struts not making noise, the struts not bent. Like, it's just, how would I fix that? Well, I go out there and say like, and most of the time the customer doesn't want to buy the bolts for me, you yeah. know, because they don't want to go and do the alignment over again and all that kind of jazz. I get it. Yeah. But, I mean, I wish that, you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, any, anytime it comes to alignment parts, it seems some of them like for the adjust, the adjustable arms and stuff, they're so goddamn expensive that most guys just don't want to do it. So what's the, what's the goal for Tobatech in 2024? Where do you see yourself going? Well, 
if we can find a uh, a uh, another red seal, I guess it's just going to be running the shop and just seeing where that brings me. Honestly, which is super exciting. I mean, when the when the business was for sale, I wanted to buy the shop. That was my plan. I I knew I was ready mentally and stuff for that. I had a lot. I wasn't there financially, unfortunately. I didn't have the finances for it, and I had some reservations where it's like, hey, if I'm pulling myself out of the out of the bay to be running, the, am I going to be able to find somebody like me that's going to be able to turn the hours and make make me money, right? So I had, and if I went into this, I was I was all in, right? I'd have to leverage my house. So if I failed, like my family's up on the street, it's all this kind of stuff. So the fact that I'm going to get to do all this kind of stuff with somebody else's money in a sense is kind of nice. Yeah. So I think, I think that's, that's where I'm, I'm at right now and just develop myself better as a, again, diagnostic tech. I want, I want one day to be known as the best guy in Winnipeg. I wow. want, you know, I'm already, it's neat. The neat thing with the Toba Tech thing is I'm already, I think, the biggest TikToker in Winnipeg. So I do get recognized on the streets sometime, which is kind of freaking cool. <laughs> and I have people coming to me all the time, right? I had a guy drive out from Brandon, which is three hours away, just so I can do a GDI service on his, on his vehicle because he saw my video. And he's like, you know, I probably could have sea phoned it myself, but if there was misfires, I wouldn't be able to deal with it, you know? So... I think in that sense is since I've been so rejuvenated with my career, with this new boss and the train, you know what I mean? Like he's even talking about sending me to ASTE next year, which I can I mean, be a kid in a candy store there. That's for sure. Dude, you'd love it, man. It's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's so, and he's even talking about coming himself. I said, you know, just come yourself. I think it'll be a good thing for you as well. Right. The, the two owners definitely Mark could would yeah. certainly benefit from it because their eyes would be opened up to, I don't want to say that they're doing anything wrong right now. They're probably not by the sounds of it, but I mean, they see the potential that's there from sitting through some of the coaching classes, especially on the business side, the technical training is, is one thing, but when you see the business side of it at all, you're, I I've taken a couple, like, well, I didn't take any classes when I went this past and the year before I took two business classes. My mind was so opened up to just how it can really work. You know what I mean? All the stuff that they teach you. The technician shortage thing, though, is is I think it's the number one issue that we're all facing in the industry, yeah, right? Hundred percent. You know, and it's just finding good good people, right? I mean, you can find bodies. That's that's not not really an issue. But like, what I'm finding too is, you know, you're finding a lot of a lot of immigrants coming in. I'm mm-hmm. Not saying it's a bad thing. I mean, Manny, Manny, he's a Punjab. Mm-hmm. one of the best apprentices I've ever had. We just hired Demo. Demo is a Chinese. He's Chinese. He's been in Canada for five years. Again, phenomenal kid. Just a hustler, just smart, super smart. And I always laugh because right now we have a Chinese Punjabi. The owner is a, is, is a Hindi. Okay. And then there's me that I'm a French Canadian. And then we have a, a Croatian guy that works part time. Like the accents in the shop are freaking hilarious. But you know, but, some of the immigrants are coming in it's just like oh yeah i you know i drained the oil and i rebuilt my 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 car i'm like okay well do you have any tools well no it's just you know so we're seeing a lot of that i mean finding that like realistically what we need as even for red seal is somebody in their 30s somebody that's that's willing to learn more that's going to be able to build into this ev hybrid if we want to go into that direction right like getting a 50 60 year old and we're getting a lot of that too we're getting 50 60 year olds uh, applying and it's like well you're kind of at the end of end of your career at this point right i mean you're not going to be learning the new stuff you're probably going to be slowing down and all this kind of stuff so it's it's hard especially being a, a four bay shop right it's just we're not we're not a big shop so we can't have the wrong guy with us for too long it's it's going to be too much of a hindrance. We need those four, four bays pumping out the work that we can. Mm-hmm. Do you find yeah. the language barrier? So in a shop like that, with that many cultures and whatnot, is it hard sometimes to teach them? No, no, no. no I- what, the, the funny part is, and I was saying that to my wife the other day. So I understand them all. Okay. Fine, right. And obviously 
there's, there's words and stuff. And even Champ, when he does his, <laughs> I, I laugh at some of the stuff he writes. But where where it's an issue, it's sometimes like when Champ is talking to Demo because you have like the Punjab <laughs> English in that, so they're not understanding each other. So they get a little frustrated. I'm sitting there laughing. I'm like, this is what he <laughs> what he means, right? So, but and. No, you know what? Like some days, obviously, you get them to repeat what they have to say, or you're all like, the thing with Manny, so which is really interesting, is he he speaks English, but it's a British English. Okay. So a lot of the, where we had miscommunications is because the words he was the English words he was using, I. Yeah. It's a Brit. It's a British way of saying it. Like he was calling a squeegee a wiper. He's like. I'm like, so I was like, hey, go grab the squeegee. He had no, he's like looking at me. He's like, I'm like the squeegee, you know, get the fucking squeegee. <laughs> and he's all like, oh, the wiper. He's not a guy. It's a freaking squeegee. So, <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong. Yeah. No. And even like certain car parts, like he'll talk about like the the heater coil or this, you know, and it's just like, it's just so different because he learned a British English, right? But he speaks well. It's just that it's a British English, not a Canadian English. <laughs> It's the beauty of Canada, right? Like everybody, oh, yeah. me, but I mean, cause I'll go down there and it's like, I'm not fluent in French, but I can speak a little bit of it. Yeah. And so it's like when I'm at the shop and something's fighting me after so many years of working in Ottawa, I tend to curse in French <laughs> and like, Oh, I can't be going good. If Jeff is like, <laughs> the, what do those words mean? And I'm like, it's, it's just all church stuff, you know, oh, it, is. <laughs> but, yeah. but it doesn't sound like church when you're saying it. So, no. Definitely not. Well, I want I want to I want to let you get back to your family and everything. This is a Sunday afternoon, and I just want to say um, I'm glad you came on and did this with me. I really appreciate it. And I was looking forward to it because I mean, you were one of the first guys that when we were on TikTok, you started to really support the podcast and you wanted to to hear it and you wanted to be on it. And I mean, that's 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 that warms my heart, man. Because I mean, that's all we're just trying to do is we're not trying to you know, we're just trying to have conversations. We're just trying to get people's stories out there and, and show that we're all more alike than we are different, you know? Yeah, no, I, I honestly, I love your podcast. Like I've, I've even tried to listen to the changing the industry and stuff like that. Honestly, I couldn't get into it. Maybe it's just the topics at the time, it's, but it's just, there, there's something about your podcast and the people that you bring on and just the way, I don't know. It's like, it's just so real. It's, it's just, you know, it's, I just love everything about it. Like I honestly, as soon as you told me that you even had a podcast, cause I know you've been commenting on my videos for quite a while. Yep. And I think your old picture, you had you standing with a bass maybe. Yeah. yeah. So I remember, and I remember you like laying to some guys a couple of times, stuff like that. So I always saw your name. Like I knew the, this Jeff Compton. And then when I had made that one video about just you know where i am in the industry and how and, and how how this whole tiktok thing has just rejuvenated myself and all of a sudden how i would like again i've always been the center of attention my whole life and and for me it's like yeah i, I want to be at two million followers i want to have like ten thousand trolls every day telling me i'm a freaking idiot like i want to be that guy yeah. Right. And I just like, there's just something about it. I don't know what it is. It's just, I love going down the street and be like, Hey, it's Toba tech. Like, it's just like, there's just something so exciting about that. And then when you told me about the podcast, it's just, I just started binge, binge listening. And yeah, I want people to listen to this stuff because it's just, again, it's, it's real. It's real, man. Like, and it's just, you having the conversations that need to happen. And, you know, we can sit there and bitch and complain about everything, you know, and pay and wages and lack, but like, we're not even willing to, to fix the issues. We aren't willing to help the apprentices. We aren't willing to, you you know, bring up our, our wages and we're scared to bring up the door rates and we're scared of all this stuff. We're so willing to give away so much of our diag and this and free this, free that. It's just like, and then we sit there and bitch and complain. It's like, I, you know, your podcast and TikTok has given, again, a new lease on life, and I want to see this industry change. I want to at least try to leave my mark on this industry as best as I can and to, like, engage as many people as I can in this industry as much as I can. And, you know, maybe that's that was my destiny for being a mechanic. Maybe that's, you know... I spent all these years trying to like get away from the, the, this industry, but maybe I have a higher purpose in here than just turning wrenches. Right. That's in people have heard me say it. If it wasn't for Facebook, 
and starting to network with all those people years ago that I did. And then now this podcast, I wouldn't be doing this for a living. I'd go work in a restaurant or something like that and start we're doing something else because I just like I, I didn't have love for it until I started to actually really network with people. And it's the same thing. You know, I'm never going to be uh, somebody that can put all this technical stuff out there like a chuck and show all these different repairs and fixes the diags and stuff like that. But I get people talking about, you know, what they've struggled against, what they love about it, what they hate about it, what they want to see improve. And if we can do all that, then we all become a little bit of a superstar. You know, yeah. and, and that's all that it's ever been for me is just to try and get people on the same wavelength. Stop judging. You know, if you want to do something for free, stop judging that person yeah. as being, you know, a crook. Here's why I don't do it for free. And then let's have a nice open ended conversation about why it isn't so that you can maybe see you don't have to change your method. Yeah. Right. But you can certainly start to understand why some people then do it that way. Yeah, value that at a different level than you do. You know, yeah. your your method is your method. My method is mine. But we got to stop the name calling. I mean, and I, and I'm just as guilty of it as an next person. I I make snap judgments. I make you know stereotypes that can't do it. I'm I'm trying. I'm better than I was. I'm better than yeah. I was. But it's it's still every day is a struggle to, you know. And that's the thing. I well, it's th- so easy to let your emotions take over. Yeah. You know, that's that's what it is. You know, especially like. So I've always been a fighter my whole life, right? When I was a kid, I used to scrap a lot. Yeah. And, you know, I always, it's always this, this instinct of mine. If you're going to come after me, we'll watch the F out because I'm going to take you down, right? You're going to come after me. But again, building a brand, I can't just be like, all the time. So I, and you know what? It's funny because like, I even did martial arts. I used to do Wing Chun for about three years and that honestly starts centering myself right to center myself mentally and it's been able to handle my rage in a sense a lot better so starting with that and coming to this and just being able like Wing Chun taught me to just step back and assess the situation and then give yourself some time to process it instead of just like going in with fists first you know and yeah it's made me a better person I think it's you know and it even conveyed my point a little bit better than just like coming out just fully aggressive all the time <laughs> It's, it's tough. You know, it's because it's just the internet and everybody all of a sudden, I think it's so, it's so condensed how we're supposed to, you know, because I mean, we can't have a conversation. It's, you're just typing. So there's yeah. no, there's no dramatic pause. There's no, when I'm thinking about how to give my answer, you don't see that when it's being typed out, right? Yeah. You don't think it, you don't hear it, you don't see it. So yeah, it's been tough for me and I, I'm, I'm working on it. So this this past week has been really good because we've got some people. <laughs> yeah. you know, and, I, and I'm not I'm not if I could do it all over again I'd do it exactly the same yeah. one thousand percent because the conversations of that what Norm brought to the table what Chris brought to the table what Brandon brought to the table it's been fantastic what Chuck brought to the table it's been fantastic to get us I feel like we're all a little bit more you know closer in the sense yeah. of understanding I understand better how they all think. Right. Yeah. Understand better now what they think, where they, where their line is in the sand on, on what their certain issues, what certain topics, certain, it, it helps me understand everybody so much better. Mm-hmm. So we, got you know, confrontation is not always a bad thing it's, yeah. and, and disagreements and arguments are not always a bad thing. It's no. still another level of communication. We just have to keep it where it's like, you know, reasonably respectful oh, and, for sure. And open ended. That's yeah. the whole thing. You that know? was like that that time that me and Rich kind of, you know, had that little head butting, I'll say. And you know, at the end he was all like, Well, you just you know, don't fall I'm like, No, it, you know, whatever. We had a little confrontation, it's not a big deal. Like, whatever. I love your content, you know, you love my content or whatnot. Hey, we we're just two opinionated pe- people that are gonna sit, say our, our piece, but doesn't mean that we need to Oh, I need to totally block Rich now because maybe me and him didn't agree on this one thing. Right? He, I, you know, there's some stuff that I probably want to that I don't agree with you or or any anybody else. But it's impossible for you to hundred percent agree with anybody over everything, right? And I think that's what we that's what the internet is is almost forgetting in a sense. People no longer can just agree to disagree. Right. It's like if you just don't believe the way I believe, you're just you're the worst person. And it's just like, yeah, 
I'd love to have more of the guys from guys and gals from TikTok on. I really would. Yeah. And, you know, Brendan talked a, a couple months ago about he almost made it to ASD and he almost was going to record and then he didn't make it. And I'd love, you know, all the, everybody that's in this little group to eventually get on here and, and, and share, you know, yeah. because I think it's such a powerful, powerful way to do it. You know, it, it, it gets everybody more familiar. You know, yeah. I know your backstory better now than I did. And, you know, it helps me understand when I see where you're coming from or why you're doing something the way you are. I, I understand better. Okay. I know exactly why he does it that way. Cause I've heard it in his heart, you know, I've heard it in his voice as to why it's so important to him. I think it's great. Hey, if you could do me a favor real quick and like comment on and share this episode, I'd really appreciate it. And please, most importantly, set the podcast to automatically download every Tuesday morning. As always, I'd like to thank our amazing guests for their perspectives and expertise, and I hope that you'll please join us again next week on this journey of change. Thank you to my partners in the ASA group and to the Change in the Industry podcast. Remember what I always say, in this industry, you get what you pay for. Here's hoping everyone finds their missing 10 millimeter, and we'll see you all again next time.